the circumcision. We worship God in spirit. Not in the flesh. To be bringing sounds from heaven. And yet we are bringing those sounds in the gyration of demonic spirits. Somebody is not praying. I can't hear. Mishaka, 
Bible says he given power to the faint. 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 And to them that have no might, he increased strength. Can you ask for power? Power to tarry. Power to wait. Power to fast. Power to pray. Power to stand in the gap. Lord, in this 120 days, I will not faint. I will not falter. I will not fail. I will not fall. He given power to the faint. 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 And to them that have no might, he increases strength. So God can increase your strength. God can increase your strength. God can increase your strength. These are not the days to faint. These are not the days to be discouraged. These are not the days to take your eyes off of the prize. We will press. We will press until we are formed. We will press until we are forged. We will press until we enter into destiny until we become the things that God has in mind Paul said it this way he said this is what I do I do not consider myself to have attained but this is what I do I put the things that are former former and I press oh my God I press I press I press I press the songwriter said yesterday is gone but today i'm in need yesterday is gone but today i'm in need lord you are the one that gives power to the faint you are the one that when the man that has no might comes to you you increase his strength god increase our strength we are rcn we are rcn we are a people called by your name we are the generation of them that seek your face increase our strength in this 120 days lord increase our strength light a fresh fire on our altar Quicken us, oh God, and we will call upon your name. Quicken us, oh God, and we will call upon your name. Quicken us, oh God, and we will call upon your name. Somebody has stopped praying. Somebody has stopped praying. We want to pray. Daddy, we want to pray. Lord, we want to pray. Lord, we want to pray. Quicken us. Quicken us. Quicken us. Somebody pray. It's not of him that wills. It's not of him that runs. It's of the Lord that showeth mercy. You can determine that you want to do that 120 days. If you do not know how to access mercy, if you do not know how to obtain mercy, 
in the Bible says it is of him that so wet mercy. Woe to the man who puts his trust in the arm of flesh. We are not trying to prove a point. We are not trying to, to set a record. We came to pray. We came to seek his face. Something must happen to our lives. Something must happen to our families. Something must happen to our ministries. Something must happen to our spiritual lives the dryness must end the deadness must end the addictions must end the afflictions must end demonic visitations must end demonic unions must end this one 20 days we must move from Egypt we must move from Babylon we must move from Sodom this one 20 days we must enter into our calling we must become what God has in mind this one 20 days there must be a total shift spirit soul and body healings must take place deliverances must take place yokes must be broken burdens must be lifted our hunger must return our fire must return our eyes must open our ears must open this thing must begin to affect our hearts christianity is not just morality Christianity is a change of heart. If it does not affect your heart, it cannot change your life. Somebody go to the Holy Ghost and say, Holy Spirit, this one 20 days, I want to pray like I have never prayed before. Holy Ghost, this one 20 days, I want to intercede like I've never interceded before. Quicken me, Holy Ghost. Quicken me, Holy Ghost. Quicken me. Oh my God, the body of the Lord. Rande Abula Faria Kobe Landia Ope Landade Shire. For some of you, this one 20 days, the Lord will call you to do vigil every night. You want to be able to stand up from that bed. Nothing must affect your commitment. Nothing must affect your prayer fire. You want to burn. You want to burn. Oh, man, I somebody cut covenant with the holy ghost say holy ghost this one 20 days i will burn incense every night every day i will burn incense he given power to the feet young lady don't say you are struggling with prayer he given power to the feet and to them that have no might he increased strength that's the scripture in my spirit that's the scripture in my spirit he given power 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 fainting men will become strong men again fainting women will become warriors again your fire is coming back your hunger is coming back your devotion is coming back your consistency is coming back your purity is coming back your consecration is coming back if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways i will hear from heaven it's a principle it's a principle it's a principle it's a day Daniel said, after I understood by the books, I humbled myself before the Lord. Lord, as we humble ourselves before you, this one 20 days, let the man Gabriel, let the man Gabriel, let the man Gabriel, let him also visit us. Shia! You have few more minutes. You have few more minutes. Go to the Holy Ghost. Quicken me, oh God. Quicken me, oh God. 
Quicken me, oh God. Quicken me, oh God. Quicken me, oh God. Quicken me, oh God. Quicken me, oh God. Quicken me, oh God. And I will call. I don't know how to do this on my own. I don't want to start and then I do not finish. I don't want to begin to fast and then I get I get stuck. Holy Ghost, this one twenty days, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Press down, shake it together, and running over. I'm ready. Holy Ghost, I'm ready. Holy Ghost, I'm ready to sow my life as a seed to sow my time as a seed I am ready out of my ashes let there be beauty out of my dying let there be a release of new life in this 120 days You are a strong man, but some of us, our help is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and the earth. This is how we have traveled for over the years that we have served the Lord. We know how to take advantage of His grace. The Bible says, Come, 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 come unto the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and help and grace for help in the time of need. Oh, somebody go to the throne of grace in one minute. Say, Daddy, this one twenty days, I don't just want to fulfill all righteousness. Something must happen to me. Oh, Lord.
that hinders my pursuit. Jesus, take it away. Take it away. If there is anything that hinders my pressing, take it away. Take it away. Oh, we will pray. We will pray. That devil is a liar. Is it not prayer? We will pray. Only my capilla. Shut the body in a cozy. The Bible speaks of Anna. He says she went into the temple day and night in fasting, in prayer, seeking the face of the Lord. Oh, oh, Lebaranash. Thank you, Father. if you can let's see what we can do in the next few minutes oh my god the fast and the prayer has already started there is obvious evidence that the Lord has already granted us flight so even though officially we are beginning tomorrow I can already sense the kindling of the fires, I can already smell the fragrance of the burning. I know that this 120 days, Satan is going to try to do everything to make sure you do not fully participate. If I were you, I will determine. You know, Isaac said to Esau, he said, in the day that you become restless, he said, you will break his yoke off your neck. If you continue to make excuses for the things that are in your life, especially the things that are limiting your progress in God, you will make those excuses for a very long time. And the consequence is you will be aware of your huge possibilities in God, but you will never be able to enter. You'll be seeing the door open. You'll be seeing the light shining on the other side. The only problem is that it will never become your reality. There's a level of resistance, a level of determination, a level of desperation that must consume you from the inside. Such that except you see the hand of the Lord in the matters of your life and destiny, you are unwilling to stop pressing. You will do whatever it takes. You will bend the knee in prayer. That's what happened to Elijah. He climbed the mountain after he had told the king Ahab, say, go, go. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. Rain is about to fall. Go, you go. He climbed to the mountain top and seven times he insisted I will not live here until I see a rain cloud. I won't live here. So in six times, every time his servant came back and said, nothing. It, the nothing was supposed to be from the angle of Satan, an opportunity for Elijah to say, okay, I don't try. But a man who is determined, he stayed there groaning. He stayed there praying because he was convinced that that rain cloud was up here. It's the only basis for me getting up from my prayer place to say I have prayed. I've taught you many times, the goal of prayer is not praying. What we see in Christian circles many of the time is that we just want to be able to achieve praying. We want to be able to tell everybody, we pray though. The goal of prayer is not praying. 
the goal of prayer is the heart of God. It's feedback. Feedback. You must be able to get to that place where you touch God's heart and because you reach his heart, what is in his hand will now be directed to your space. That's the goal of prayer. That's the goal of prayer. So we have trained ourselves that if we don't get feedback, we don't stop. So in certain cases, when you have fasted for some days, fasted for some weeks, fasted for some months, and nothing has shifted, you take a break. Give your flesh something to eat for a while. Then you come back and you keep pressing. Because God cannot lie. It is not in his character. What that scripture means is that even if God attempted, he cannot lie. He, if God cracks a joke, the joke becomes reality. God cannot lie. He cannot crack a joke. So if he said to you, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. It's not, it's not something to make you excited. It is a guarantee. It's a promise that the one that asks will receive. The one that seeks will, 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 will find. The one that knocks onto that one, the door will be open. And if you read it in the original, in the original Greek, it says keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. It's, it's a continuous process. Because the end game of your inquiry in God by the mode of prayer is that something escapes from the invisible realm into your space. Into your space. Most of the time, the reason people become tired on the pathway of prayer is that they do not begin their prayer endeavor with expectation. It is the atmosphere of expectation that creates the possibility for feedback. The atmosphere of expectation. Remember when Peter and John went to the temple and they got to the gate beautiful, they met a crippled man there. And the Bible says when the man saw them, he said, looking upon them and expecting to receive something. That expectation already made it possible for the things that God wanted to do with his life to find expression in his life. Don't approach this 120 days with a mindset of carnality. It's not a carnal journey. It's not a canal journey. Your spiritual life will be totally altered. Your finances, your health, areas of your life that have been afflicted by demonic activity, we must break it in these 120 days. That pattern, that cycle that you keep saying, oh, uh, every time I fast, then after six months of freedom, one, one night, somebody will come and sleep with me in dinner. It must end. Such stories must end. They don't have a place in your nomenclature as a child of God. But sometimes because we pamper it, we allow it to happen. There's no anger. There's something called holy anger. That's what Jesus demonstrated when he went into the temple with a whip. You need to carry a whip this 120 days and clean out your temple. There's something called spiritual sanitation. You clean out your temple. Clean out your space. Anything that has given Satan a foothold, you approach it, you approach it with anger and you won't stop until your victory is secure. Your victory is secure. And this is the whole essence of preparing our hearts. For almost how many weeks now, we've been teaching the same series on priesthood to get us ready to engage. So if you've been here since the beginning, I have told you, that the system that is called priesthood is a system that God uses to be able to en ensure that his will, his plans, and his purposes find expression in the earth. So priesthood is a system. And in this system, you have the priest, you have the altar, you have the sacrifice, and you have the temple. And I've taught you who the priest is. I told you that the priest is the one that is authorized by God to minister unto him in sacred things. So the priest is a minister in sacred things. Not common things, sacred things, things that relate to the worship of Jesus. He's a minister. And because he has been called to minister in sacred things, 
there's a way a priest must order his life. He can't live like everybody else. This is why the priesthood was consecrated and separated from the people. They were separated. Those that were in that office were separated to give the people an understanding that even though this one walks like a man, talks like a man, looks like a Jew, is an Israelite by birth, he's no longer the same with you. He has been selected by God to function in matters that relate to the holy. He's an officer of the holy things. He's one that has been consecrated and commissioned by God to handle things that are holy. Things that pertain exclusively to God. That's where priest was. Apart from that authorization that he receives by the anointing that is poured upon his head and by the garments that he's ordained to wear, a priest was also one that offers sacrifice. Offers sacrifice. So he needed to be spiritually educated enough to understand the requisite sacrifices re associated with the various conditions of fallen man. So things that were happening to humanity that needed to be atoned for, that needed to be uh, repented of, he knew the appropriate sacrifices to bring before the great king. He was a man that brought offerings. And I taught you in these few weeks that the first offering that he brings is the offering of his own life. He relinquishes the right to his life. He no longer lives for himself. He lives for the dictates, the commandments, and the purposes of God. So even his dress code was regulated by God. Who he's allowed to marry was regulated by God. Where he's allowed to go, regulated by God. What to touch, what to eat. Everything had rules and regulations because he was no longer his own. He was a priest unto God. Unto God. And I told you that this thing, this rule, holds true both in the positive supernatural and in the negative supernatural. Go to the negative supernatural and look at men that service the altars of wickedness and demonic activity. You will see that they too recognize that they are priests unto that devil, that demonic spirit. They recognize so that spirit regulates the way they dress, regulates where they live, regulates how they live. So somebody will tell you that he can make you rich, but he's living in squalor. The place around his house is even smelling. It is the consecration that is required for him to wield that level of power and authority. So the priest recognizes that he was one that was to bring sacrifices. I also told you that the third thing about the priest is that the priest is a mediator between God and man. Mediator between God and man. So the priest is the most critical element of the priesthood. Every other element in the priesthood is heavily dependent on the priest. And the priest is the bridge between the invisible and visible, between the spiritual and the material between the seen and the unseen. He is that bridge between God and man. So he goes to God on behalf of man and then he comes to man on behalf of God. The priest. And I told you that if you become skilled in your priesthood adequately, you will also metamorphose into what is called a prophetic intercessor. And what a prophetic intercessor is, is one who knows how to peep into the mind of God, understand the promises of God, understand the burdens of God, understand the calendars of God, and then turn those matters into prayer points to shift, shift and shape the lives of men. So he prays from a place of knowledge. And I told you that that transition is dual. There's a prayer that is from the known to reality, and there's a prayer from the unknown to the known. So the priest must be able to make those transitions and make those journeys because he's adequately skilled in the matters of priesthood. 
So the priest was one that is obsessed with the presence of God. He's obsessed with the presence of God. The reason he must be obsessed with the presence of God is because he has been given a unique access that other men do not have. Only him could approach God. So the question everybody will ask of the priest is, what have you done with the presence? What have you done with that access? Because if you are adequately schooled in priesthood, you will wield such authority, such power, that atmospheres can shift at your appearing. Situations can change because of your commitment and your consistency. Because you know how to approach the throne of God. And you know how to come back from the throne of God with instruments and tokens that can change the situations of mortal man. So that's who the priest is. So by the time I finish talking about the priest, I spoke to you about the altars. There's no time to go over that once again. So I told you there are two basic altars. There's the altar of burnt offering where the priest dies. The idea of the altar of burnt offering is that you will die to self. You will die to flesh. The fragrance of your dying should ascend to heaven. You cannot do priesthood in the flesh. The fires that the priesthood will burn with, whether it is to burn the sacrifice or to burn incense, must be a fire that is lit by the Lord. So your burdens must come from the Lord. If the burden does not initiate from the belly of the spirit, you'll be trying to keep it alive by the arm of your flesh and that's where people become frustrated in prayer. So he dies at the altar of burnt offering. And I said that that altar is called a bronze altar. If you read it in the Old King James, it says brazen. Brazen is simply the word for bronze. And if you know your metals in the Bible, I've taught you repeatedly, bronze is for judgment, silver is for redemption, gold speaks about the character and the nature of God. That's what your metals are. So that's why that is called the brazen altar. It's the altar of bronze. It's the altar of judgment. That's where your flesh is judged. Your pride is judged. So if you, if you engage in priesthood accurately, you will fall in love with the hidden life. You will not like visibility. And this is why, if you notice, the temple was stratified. It was categorized. You began your journey in the outer court. This is where every priest begins their journey outer court. But if you stay consistent, you will become a frequent visitor in the Holy of Holies. You will be qualified to go behind the veil. You will go behind the veil. And if you notice, just read through scriptures and you see the things that happened in the temple, it is in the Holy of Holies you encounter the Shekinah. Anything outside of the inner court and the Holy of Holies, you cannot have supernatural encounters. The outer court is for ministry, choir, protocol, uh, usher, ministry unto men. But a priest's ministry is not only a ministry to men. In fact, his first and primary ministry is his ministry to God. But many get enraptured and encapsulated and enamored by the things that happen in the outer court and they get satisfied. So people are clapping for them. That's the reason we have entertainers doing our praise and worship now. Because they want to sing songs that will get you excited. The, the motive is to, is, to, is, to, is, to, is to get you excited. And I'm going to deal with these matters on Sunday, beginning on Sunday. It's to get you feel, feel good. Meanwhile, the worship is not for you. It's not for you. You are supposed to be a participator in the process. It's not you that is the center of attraction. The center of attraction is a deity. One who is invisible, immortal. The Bible says he's only wise. Holy is his name. Holy is his name. You are supposed to come in and participate. But what we do is that praise and worship leaders are looking for songs that will excite people. Feed their loss. Elevate their idols. Quicken their flesh. That's why you hear things like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How does how does that that thing? How does it elevate Jesus? How? It's because they want you to dance. They want you to be excited, and they know that you have been listening to these things in the world. So they want to create an alternate system for you to enjoy the world's goods in the house of prayer. It's an abomination. 
But the reason it has continued to thrive is that the average priest does not understand that your ministry is not outer court. Outer court is only effective if it is a function of inner court engagement. So it is what is happening in the secret that empowers you to accurately function in the outer court. But many Christians are obsessed with outer court ministry. So you have people who are in protocol, who are in usher, who are in sanitation, who are in various departments. They don't have a prayer life. They don't have anything with Jesus. The thing that Christianity is acting is showbiz. So you have what they call gospel showbiz. You know, some things I see, I want to vomit. What is gospel showbiz? Showbiz in gospel. Show business. That's why we have nomenclatures like Christian entertainers. They are Christians that they, 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 they receive the anointing from the Lord to come and entertain us. Entertainment. It's because there's a hunger within the body. A hunger within the body. I've taught you before. A Christian cannot be called an entertainer. He's a minister. He's in ministry, not entertainment. Ministry. So if he is called to the creative arts, 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 for instance, as an actor, that acting is supposed to minister, not entertain. If it is entertaining, that, that Christian has lost his calling. He's now a weapon in the hand of Babylon and Sodom. He's supposed to minister. He's supposed to minister life. To everyone that hears, everyone that watches, they must have an engagement with the same spirit that that priest has met in the Holy of Holies. So we don't look for trending topics. The question for the, the Christian in whatever area of ministry he is in is what is the spirit of the Lord saying? Not trending topics. What is the spirit of the Lord saying? It's on the basis of that that he comes out of the Holy of Holies and then he has authorization to minister in the outer court. But you see what we do now is what is the world saying? Then on the basis of the temperature of carnal men, the state of their hearts, and the idols that have risen in the hearts of those who are supposed to be priests, we begin to design services. So you enter into a church worship meeting and you find out that the altars have been raised, are raised to an unknown God. It's not the God of the Bible. Not the God of the Bible. So this is why his journey begins at the brazen altar where appetites are judged. State of his heart is judged. So he prays prayer like David. Search me. See if there be any secret fault. And lead me in the way everlasting. Once he journeys from that altar, his final destination before he prostrates before the Lord in a posture of death because once he goes behind the veil, he will be in a posture of death, waiting for the Shekinah. Because there are only two options. Either the Shekinah arrives as a sign of validation, that yes, you have been accepted, or he dies there. If he has broken any of the laws, breached any protocol, he will come out of the presence of God as a corpse. This is how fire came from the presence of the Lord and consumed Nadab and Abihu. They went into God's presence alive. They came out dead. Because they had breached protocols. Breached protocols. So the priest, just before he goes into that place, in a posture to lie before the Lord, waiting for the Shekinah, he must now come to the altar of incense. And the altar of incense, just like the altar of burnt offering, is an altar of acacia wood, but it is plated with gold. While the offering outside, the altar outside is plated with bronze, this one is plated with gold. So you have judgment, then you have the nature of God. You have death to self, here you have life, fellowship, spirit to spirit. Your spirit can now engage the spirit of God. And the things that exist in the belly of God can be communicated to you. The Bible says, no man knoweth the things that are in the heart of God, except the spirit of God. And he says, the spirit searcheth all things, yea, even the deep things. It's at that level of intercourse that things that other mortals call mysteries 
now become your inheritance. You know the things of God. You know the things that have been freely given to you. You know how to pray. You know how to engage. God can show you in that place 15 years ahead of your life. He can show you 25 years ahead of your territory. He can take you to ancient antiquity and show you things that were done before you were born so that you can stand on a pedestal of knowledge and war the good warfare. That's how we fight. We fight from a place of knowledge. We see things that were closed. We take advantage of that information. And then we can claim deliverance. We can command deliverances unto Jacob. So all this infrastructure is what go together to make up what is now called the priesthood. You know the way of the altar. You know the way of the priest. You know the way of the sacrifice. The one I want to teach tonight is the way of the temple. So I've taught you the tools of the priest. I've taught you sacrifice, the tools for sacrifice. I've taught you the tools for the altar. If you do not remember, go back and listen. One of the major tools of the altar is what? Fire. Fire. And I explained to you what the Bible calls strange fire. The fire that you must wield at the altar must be the fire that is lit by the Lord himself. So what is the way of the temple? In your journey of priesthood, if you forget everything I've said tonight, don't forget this. A critical dimension of your priesthood is praying with other believers. I told you in one of the parts that when you speak about the temple in under the new covenant, the temple is two-dimensional. One, the temple is you. Because in the New Testament, remember, we don't have the time. But if you go back and study, you will remember that everything in the Old Testament was just a shadow of what was to come. There were metaphors used to describe spiritual realities that will become our reality when we come back into divine union with Christ. So in the Old Testament, the priest was an individual. The altar was physical. The temple was physical. The sacrifice was bulls. It was rams. But in the new covenant, you are the priest. You are the temple. You are the altar. You are the sacrifice. In the new testament, new covenant. You are the priest. You are the temple. You are the sacrifice. You are the altar. So everything is encapsulated in the one that has come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So when we speak about the temple under the New Testament reality, we are speaking about you. And then we are speaking about what? The church. Are you with me? The temple is you and it is the church. So we have dealt extensively with you as a temple. I've spoken to you about the priest, about how you must stay pure, I must stay holy. The tools of the temple I want to speak about or the way of the temple I want to speak about tonight has to do with the church. And this is why I said a critical area of your priesthood is praying with what? Other believers. It's a critical dimension of your priesthood. Very critical. Let me show you some scriptures. Go to Isaiah. I think it's 56. Isaiah 56, give me verse 7. Isaiah 56 and verse 7. It says, even them, the them there, the them there, are the ones who have become candidates of salvation because of their obedience. That's what it means by them. Even them. Because if you read this scripture from verse 1, it was speaking about the fact that not only those who are Israelites, but even those who are strangers and eunuchs, they will also be qualified to be brought to his holy mount. We don't have the time. I'm watching the clock. But when you get to go and read it from verse 1, it says, even them I will bring to where? My holy mount. You remember Hebrews? The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, but ye have come to where? Mount Zion. Mount Zion. What is Mount Zion? The city of the living God. He says, even them I will bring to my holy mountain. 
and make them joyful where? In my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted where? On my altar. For my house shall be called a what? A house of prayer for what? All nations. This is the destiny of the church. The church is not a platform for entertainment. You are not the center of attraction in the church. The center of attraction in the church is the king of kings. And the primary obligation of the church is what? Prayer. This is what he says. The Lord was speaking through the prophet Isaiah. He said, my house shall be called a what? A house of prayer for how many people? All nations. Everybody will come. Both Jews, both Greek, both Gentiles. Everybody who has become a candidate of salvation through obedience. Give me verse 1. Let me show you that so that you, it, it, it clicks in your, in, your, in your spirit. Give me verse 1. First says the Lord God, keep what? Justice. And do what? For my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be what? Revealed. Next verse. Verse 2. Blessed is the man who does what? What is this? What is this? Go back to verse 1. What is this? Blessed is the man who does this. What is this? Keeps justice and does what? Righteousness. Go back to verse 2. And the son of man who lays hold on it. What is it? Justice and what? Righteousness. Who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any... Go back to verse 7. Go back to verse 7. Even them. So it is them that have kept justice and have done righteousness, who have kept their hands from doing evil, that will be brought where? To the house of prayer. And this language you are looking here, you are looking at here, this is a language of priesthood. Look at it. There is prayer, there is sacrifice, there is altar, and there is a house, there is a temple. For my house shall be called what? A house of prayer. For how many people? Give me Matthew 21. Jesus emphasized this. Matthew 21 verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold those. So Jesus went into the temple, drove them out. The Bible says he made a whip. He was grieved and he drove them out. And then in the next verse, and he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it what? What was his house? The temple. He was speaking about the temple. In this case, we can look at the dual meaning of the temple again. The temple which is you, the Bible says, know ye not that ye are what? And the spirit of the Lord doeth what? Dwelleth in you. So you are the temple. And the church is the temple. So in both cases, you are supposed to be a house of prayer. You as an individual. Prayer is something that is supposed to be happening consistently within your vessel on a, on a daily basis. You must know the way of prayer. And the church, any place where they are gathering and they call it a church of Jesus Christ, and it is not a house of prayer. That place is not the house of God. That's what the Bible is saying. It says, my house shall be called what? A house for breakthrough. A house for wedding. A house for offering. What was the primary thing? A house of prayer. So Jesus was reiterating what God spoke to Isaiah. Is it wrong to do weddings in the church? No, that's not what I'm saying. Is it wrong to have breakthrough in church? That's not what I'm saying. But the emphasis of the church must be what? Any church that has relegated prayer to the background has opened the door for another spirit to find expression. This is why we have begun to look for other things to make up for our lack of commitment to design. Because it is only when you align in the spirit that what is in the belly of God can find expression in the earth. Our primary labor in the natural is alignment. If you can only align, ah, it's finished. 
our primary labor in the spirit, all this prayer thing we are doing, what we call acts of ascension or tools for ascension, fasting, prayer, singing songs of worship, dancing, praising sound. The whole reason is that we are trying to align. We want to come into the frequency of heaven so that when you find that frequency, what is in the spirit now has a lease and a right of way to break out upon the earth. That's what it's about. It's alignment. So if you are not aligning by prayer, it means another spirit has found that expression. And you will see it in all the kind of things we do. People are coming to church, they are clapping for them. I'm not against all these things because if I say I'm against it now, it will cause problem. But to him that does all these things, to him, to him. But you see, the reason we do those things is that we don't understand what the house of God is for. So you, you, you hear people talk, talking about things they call seeker-friendly churches. The church is not for the seeker. The church is to, for us to gather, to raise incense to the great immortal spirit. His house must be called a house of prayer. You see, brethren, these 120 days that we want to labor, you see, make sure that you do not come to sit in the meetings and just pass time. You know why? Because in a house of prayer, in a house of prayer, a corporate body can be the platform upon which we decide to take flight. But in the midst of the corporate body, individual matters can be settled. Are you with me? Have you read Acts chapter 13, verse 2? The Bible says, while they ministered unto the Lord. A translation says, while they worshipped and fasted and prayed. So the, the premise upon which they were gathering was corporate. While they ministered unto the Lord. While and fasted and prayed. The Holy Spirit now said, set aside Paul and Barnabas. So matters of destiny became urgent matters that day. Out of a corporate expression. This is why if you look at the slides that we sent out, we said, one of the ways to align is to write your own prayer points. Write it. Apart from the corporate bodies that will be coming from the altar, you have your own individual prayer point. In the house of prayer, as long as it, as it is God we are engaging with, even your individual matters can be addressed. Just like that day. Paul and, is it Paul and Barnabas or is Paul and Silas? It's Paul and Barnabas. They didn't come to that meeting that day trying to engineer a word from the Lord. Hmm? It was in the midst of corporate intercession. Look at it now. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit did what? Said. Who were the people ministering? Go to verse 1. Go to verse 1. Verse 1. Verse 1. Verse 1. Now in the where? Where was the church? Antioch. They were setting who? Prophets. They were teachers. Barnabas. Simeon who was called Niger. Lucius of Syrian. Manin who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And so. So in the church. They named those that were the functionaries that were there. But that whole prayer enterprise was being done by who? The church. This is how our forefathers lived. The church was a house of prayer. Let me show you some examples. Give me Matthew 19. Give me verse 18. Oh, if there is anything that hinders my priesthood. <laughs> Jesus, take it away. Take it away. Huh? Is that what I'm looking for? Give me verse 15. This is 19 I'm looking for. Give me 9. Give me Matthew 9. Ah. Or is it 18? Let me find it. If two or three shall agree as touching anything, where scripture is that? 
Is it in? It in. Ah. 18, 18, give us 18, 18. 18, 18. Ah. As shortly I say to you, whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be lose where? In heaven. Next verse, 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree where on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done by them by my father where? In heaven. Next verse. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there where? This part of priesthood. This is why it was very easy that in that place of corporate prayer, God could speak about Paul and Barnabas. Because he's there. He's there. This is why we pray corporately. It's not as if you cannot do this 120 days yourself. I was speaking with one of my sons here and he was saying to me, he said, this fasting self is just like it's normal. He has been fasting since the beginning of the year. That's how he lives. Many of us here, that's how we live. We live like that. It's a normal thing. We eat once a day. Once in a while, we decide that this body needs extra nutrients. So we eat twice a day. But we live, we live like that. It's not like nobody can, cannot do this thing on their own. But there's a, there's a dimension of priesthood that requires corporate labors to unlock certain things. Sure, you know that many of you don't know the context in which this scripture was written. Have you read this story in context? Do you know what they were talking about? Do you know what they were talking about? They were talking about the ability to ostracize somebody from the church. That if two of you agree that this brother is no longer one of us, heaven will back it. Okay. Go to verse 15. Go to verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have done what? Gained your brother. Next verse. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be what? Established. 17. And if he refuses to hear them, do what? We are not here. Tell it to who? The church. Next verse. Well, go back there. I will finish reading that one. Tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a what? He then enters collector. Next verse. As shortly. Are you with me now? Are you seeing the context? If you and your brother have an issue, Take two, three people and say, bro, I'm sorry. Settle the matter. If he refuses those two people, go and tell it to who? The church. Who, who is the representative of the church? The elders. So the elders of the church will call you people and say, ah, brother Jackson, solve this matter. If he still refuses to hear, the Bible says that, let him be to you like one of the hidden, like an unbeliever. Then Jesus now said, if you make him like one of the unbelievers, assuredly, Without doubt, I tell you whatsoever you bind. So a man that has been made like one of the human believers has been bound. He has been cast out from the corporate company of the church. Are you with me? It's not me or his scripture. Hmm? He says, whatever you bind on earth, that means heaven will recognize it because the church is a symbol of God's authority in the earth. Are you with me? Yes, sir. It's on this basis that we are gathering to pray. So when we, we gather as a church here, huh, and we are praying for the territory, whatsoever we bind is bound. That's the authority the corporate house has. That's why even though you are, you are skilled and you are effective in individual priesthood, there is a time for the company of priests to come together. And on the strength of everybody's supply, everybody's oil, we form what is called the Ecclesia. The government in that place, we can now issue decrees. It's no longer dependent on your individual state. It's now a corporate persona 
That's what Peter meant when he said in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says that ye all as lively what? Stones are being built up into a what? A spiritual house. That's right. You know your Bible. That you may offer what? Sacrifices. In that spiritual house, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. So all of us are stones. And we are brought together. And we build a spiritual house. And then we can offer what? Sacrifice. In that portion of scripture, I think that's 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. He says that our sacrifices are praises and thanksgiving. And you will know that thanksgiving is one of the dimensions of prayer. Paul says that be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer, supplication, and what? Thanksgiving. Make your requests. How? No, no. So what we are trying to do is that we want to form a quorum in these 120 days, both on site and online. We want to establish the authority of God and stretch forth his rod upon territories, upon families, upon individual lives. And whatsoever we bind is bound. The Bible says, if two shall agree as touching anything. This is what happened in Acts chapter 12. If you understand this, you will now know why Acts chapter 12 was so potent. The Bible says, Herod took James, killed him. He saw that the police setting of the Jews. He now went and took who? Peter. And bound him. But in verse 5, the Bible says, but prayer Ooh. was made. Look at it now. He said, Peter was there, therefore kept in prison. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by who? The church. The church. Now when you read this, you think it's everybody that was in the church that was there. But we found out that it was in the house of Mary. Because if you are a member of the body, and those of you that can congregate are priests in the correct order, God is not constrained to win by few or with many. The problem with God is never quantity. It is quality. If the quality of priests that gather are of the right context, even Herod will bow. Even captives that have been determined to die. Because Herod was going to execute Peter the next day. But an angel. Why did the angel escape? Because the Ecclesia on the face of the earth began to enforce government. They began to enforce government. Any church that does not know the way of prayer. I don't even advise you to stay in a place where there is no corporate prayer. That's why in RCN, everybody is taught how to pray. Everybody. Even though we have an intercessory group, we pray together. It's not showmanship. It's so that you too will learn the way of priesthood. So that when we come to a corporate gathering, you will not be the weak link. No matter how small you are, you can bring your own supply. The Bible says every joint fitly supplies. Every joint. Bring your own Let me show you one last scripture. Give me Acts chapter 4. Give me verse 29. Acts chapter 4 and verse 29. Now, the, this you remember this story? Peter and John were preaching in the temple and then they caught them. I love that story so much because one of the parts I love the most, it says, when they told them, don't preach again. They say, you judge, you, you think up, think up. Whether to obey you or to obey God. Which one do you think? You, you, you think. Of. To have the boldness to tell your captors that kind of thing. Ah, it, it is with me. Because left to other people, when they say, no preacher, they say, yes sir. They say, they say when they say, wisdom, I just thought about it. That if I say no, they will slap me. So wisdom is profitable to direct. So I said, I said yes sir, there, but in my mind, I was saying no sir. No. They looked, they looked at them. The people that just finished beating them. They say, you, you judge whether it is right to obey you or to obey God. And they left. Immediately they left, bro. They didn't go and start weeping and crying. And say, they beat us. See my back. Say, oh, what an honor to survive for Jesus. No. They, they got back and they called their brothers in verse 29. And you know what they began to do? They say, Lord, behold, they are threatening. 
whole car anymore. These guys, they were not like human beings. You know why? They've been to the Holy of Holies. They were not afraid of men that could kill the body. They knew one who could kill both body and soul and commit it to wear hellfire. They knew him. When you have seen him in the Shekinah, mortal man will look like, like a flea. He will look like, a, like an ant. When he's threatening, if they appear in your dream and say, we go kill you, you start laughing. You know he's not giving to that spirit. You have seen his glory. And you know that except he wants you to die, no demon can kill you. No demon. He said, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may do what? Speak your word. Next verse. By stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be drawn done through the name of your holy servant who? Jesus. Last verse, 20, 21. And when they had prayed, look at the, the, oh my God. They were able to draw something from the heavens. I'm hoping that we will have these kind of experiences. If they could do it, if they knew how to operate corporate prayer in the temple, we too must, must know it. Because what he does to one is a parable he can do it to all. He says, the place where they were assembled together was shaking. Even though they had experienced Pentecost before. This is what you call another measure. Another measure. And they all were filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happened? They spoke the word. So the tool of corporate prayer within the temple is in three dimensions. So number one, in corporate prayer, we pray the watches. We pray the watches. There's what is called the prayer watch. I'm wrapping up now, don't worry. We pray the watches. If you go back and read, the Bible says it was at the hour of prayer that Peter and John were going to the temple. That's when they saw the man at the gate called beautiful. What are the watches? If you remember in Genesis, the Bible will tell you the evening and the morning was the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day. So the watches begin in the evening. So your first watch is 6 p.m. Your second watch is 9 p.m. Your third watch is 12 a.m. And then your final watch is 3 a.m. So you have four night watches and you have four day watches. So 6 p.m., 9 p.m., 12 a.m., 3 a.m., 6 a.m., 9 a.m., 12 p.m., 3 p.m. Those are your watches. So the average Israelite prayed through the prayer watches. So it was even at such a time that Peter and John were going to the temple to join other Israelites to pray. So, in corporate prayer, we pray the prayer watches. In corporate prayer, we pray what is called scriptural prayers. Scriptural prayers. Scriptural prayers. Notice, when you read the Old Testament, you'll find out that many times when they got into trouble, they will go back and they will begin to remind the Lord. Did you not say through the mouth of your prophets? This is why when you look at some of us that lead prayers here, we don't just pray. We'll be telling you, the Bible says so and so. Then we use it as a, as a prayer point. So in the corporate house, one of the ways that we have uh, activate the power of the Ecclesia is that when we pray, we pray scriptural prayers. Why? Because one, the scripture are promises waiting for fulfillment designed to find fulfillment in your life. Number two, the scriptures are commandments that you are expected to obey. So you pray them. You pray the promises. As you pray the promises, your prayer is that they will find fulfillment either in your individual life, in the life of the church, or in the life of the territory. They are commandments. You pray the commandments, reminding yourself the way you have been ordained to live, and reminding yourself the things that God considers priorities. Number three, the scriptures are prophecies. Prophecies. 
pictures of the plans, the purposes, the wills, will of God for his people, for a generation, for his church. So we pray those prophecies so that those prophecies will be full, fulfilled. Last not least, you pray the prayers of God. In a corporate house, we pray the prayers of God. What are the prayers of God? These are burdens that are on the heart of God that he communicates to his church part time and season. They are the burdens of the Lord. He communicates them to us part time and season. So those amongst us who have, who have honed or um, developed their prophetic gift are able to pick things that are burdens in the heart of the Lord, matters on the Lord's heart, and then they communicate it to us, and then we make those items, prayer burdens, and through those prayer burdens, we are able to exact government on lives, on territories, and on the church. Can you bow your heads tonight? Ask the Lord for grace. I want you to pray one prayer before you pray for yourself. Say, Lord, make us a strong corporate house. Arusian worry. Pray that prayer. A strong corporate house. Whether you are on site or online, you are part of Arusian worry. Make us a strong corporate house that whatever we bind, build us up. The Bible says we are being built into a spiritual house. That means every one of us must become a lively stone. Lively simply means living, living stone, not dead stones. God doesn't build with dead stones. He builds with living stones. Make us a strong corporate house. None of us will be weak links. Are you praying? Please pray. None of us will be weak links. All those talk of masturbation, pornography, he dies. He dies. Every one of us, the least amongst us will be as strong as David. As strong as David. As strong as David. Pray quickly. We have run out of time. Pray quickly. A strong corporate house. That what we lose is loose. In worry, in Africa, in the nations of the world, every time we stand here to pray, that's the way Solomon prayed when he dedicated the temple. He said, any time we gather here, even when strangers come and they lift up their voices, he says, God, you will answer. You will answer. Tell the Lord, when we cry for individuals, when we cry for the barren, when we cry for the lost, when we cry for the unsaved, when we cry for, for, the, for the areas of our territory that are darkened, let the scepter of authority over this house be sharpened. In this 120 days, let us become one man in the spirit. Let us bond. If two or three shall agree as touching anything, that scripture is powerful. Anything. Anything from the point man to all the ministers to all the workers to every member of RCN in Nigeria in various cities of the world we become a force an ecclesia a representation a representative of the government and the authority of heaven in the earth the least amongst us will be as strong as David the least the least will be as strong as David even if the person is alone in youth service, the oil will still be flowing to reach them there. Everyone, the least, will be as strong as David. A little one shall become a thousand. A thousand. When you finish praying that prayer, in one minute, pray for yourself. Say, I will not be a weak link. No. I will not be a weak link. I will not be the open door to damage the corporate priesthood. No, not me. Not me. Not me. Not me. Not me. Not me. I will not be the access door. Oh, if there is anything that hinders my priesthood. Make sure you are praying. Jesus, take it away. Take it away. If there is anything that hinders my priesthood, Jesus, take it away. Oh. Take it away. 
Aye. If there is a living that hinders my pressing, Jesus, take it away. You are praying for yourself. Take it away. If it is sleep, if it is food, if there is anything that hinders my breeze, take it away. Take it away. If there is anything that hinders my worship, take it away. Take it away. If there is anyone, anyone that hinders my priesthood, Jesus, take them away. Take them away. Take them away. If there is anything hinders my priesthood, take it away. Consistently help me, Lord, to know your heart. Know your heart, know your heart. Know your heart, know your heart. Consistently hey. help me, Lord, to seek your face. Seek your face, seek your face. eagles this one 20 days so the days you are feeling tired just come to the house of prayer just come just come here you will find strength for we will pray we will pray we will pray and the name of the lord will be glorified thank you jesus